Welcome to River of Life Online. My name is Brent Hudson, pastor of River of Life Church. Today we have Michael Messenger with us from World Vision Canada. He's going to share with us a message of hope and challenge about joining Jesus in the margins. Continue with us today, and I pray that God would be with you as we learn and as we are challenged together. Welcome to River of Life uh, for today's time of worship and teaching. Uh, I'm Brent Hudson, the pastor of River of Life Church. I want to share with you as we begin a very important psalm, which is used a lot, uh, but yet has basically been something which has comforted my heart. Let's go to the psalm now and uh, refresh our heart with God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. I've always found that psalm to be a comfort to me because uh, we often don't think of God in terms of being a shepherd. We think of Jesus as the good shepherd, and we think of Jesus in these ways, but sometimes we create this uh, this chasm between what we know of God in Jesus and then our understanding of God, the one who is overall working out things in the, in the cosmos. And yet the character that we see in Jesus, the love that we see in Jesus, uh, is in fact the love that comes from the very heart of God. And we need to reimagine who God is based on what Jesus teaches us about God. For as the scriptures tell us, no one has seen God except Jesus, the one and the only begotten one who was in the bosom of the Father. And we need to take that to heart. We need to start reorganizing our understanding of who God is with our understanding of who Jesus is. And uh, it is good to know that the Lord is our shepherd. It is good to know that the thing, the, the attitude and the character and the heart that we see in Jesus Christ is the heart of God toward us. After all, it was love that inspired God to send his son. It was love uh, that drove Jesus to the cross for you and me. And it is love that brings his spirit into our lives, even in this very moment of isolation and difficulty, to give us comfort, to give us joy, and to give us a sense that God is with us, even in the most difficult of times. Today, we have a great service. Uh, I mean, it's my first week back in a couple of weeks, and I, I kind of feel a little bit guilty, but we had Michael Messenger scheduled for this service that uh, separates our previous series with uh, our Easter series coming up. And, uh, and we've been wanting to hear from Michael. Uh, Dave and I have worked with Michael Messenger in the past, and of course Dave Morehouse from the Journey Church was, has been on the board of uh, World Vision Canada for uh, a decade and a half now, and he's coming off the board now, but has developed some great relationships and, uh, and has also been the voice of the church uh, to this very global organization helping the world's poor. Uh, we had Michael uh, speak to us today. We, we have a recording. Obviously, he wasn't coming to Moncton. <laughs> That's not allowed. But uh, we have a recording of a message that Michael uh, has preached in different churches. And uh, we want to share that uh, today at River of Life. And I want to uh, uh, have an opportunity to talk with Michael after the message to just ask a little bit about uh, it um, and his heart and, uh, and I think that it will be an encouragement for us as we learn to follow Jesus to the margins. But before we do that, let's take a moment and pray together. 
God, we thank you for your grace and your love and your compassion. And God, sometimes we feel all alone and we feel like we are isolated, not just in physical distancing, but that our souls have been cut off. And God, we pray that your spirit would come and minister to us in such times, that you would help us and heal us, that, Lord, you would see the, the people around us, even in this time of isolation, who pray for us and who care for us. And maybe in a season of pandemic, we're not able to reach out and to be the same as we were in the past, but we are still there, standing for one another, uh, supporting each other. And God, help us to gain strength from that. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins and the times when we have only thought about our own pain and not looked out and saw the pain and the, and the concerns of others. Help us to be a people uh, like a healing balm in this world. Help us to be part of the medicine that heals the brokenness of our world. And Lord, help heal us. Uh, in fact, heal us uh, by the power of Jesus Christ, by your Holy Spirit. We do pray, God, as we listen to Michael Messenger from World Vision Canada, that, Lord, you would open our hearts and that you would help us to see perhaps uh, the world in a new way and that you would help us to understand that even though we're all suffering, there are those who are suffering far greater than we are and uh, our hearts need to be open to them as well. Help us to truly hear what Michael has to say. And I thank you so much for Michael for his leadership, for his skills, uh, for his uh, beginnings here in Moncton, and uh, how he has uh, now become a leader in um, a, a global organization here in Canada. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to watch over him and give him your spirit and help him to, uh, to follow you as, uh, uh, as he goes into some of the world's most difficult places and sees some of the most incredible things, both joyful and sorrowful. Protect his heart and, and lead him and help us as we hear today about Jesus in the margins. And I pray, God, that you would give us the courage and the strength to join him there. Help us in this, we pray in Christ's name. All right, now we go to Michael Messenger. Well, good morning. It is so good to be with you. Uh, before we start, let me just say a big thank you to you, your whole community, your pastors for inviting me to share today. I can't tell you how much I wish I could be with you. Uh, I don't know if you know, I actually grew up, was born and grew up in Moncton, New Brunswick. Where you are is home for me. I wish I could be with you, joining you in that Atlantic bubble. Today, I want us to chew on this big idea. Following Jesus leads us to the margins. So let's begin. Now, do you know what I mean when I talk about margins? A great illustration comes from the movie, The Lion King. Now, I think this is one of Disney's best. You know that movie. Uh, it came out in 1994, at least the animated version, and about five years before my kids were born. But nevertheless, it was something that was on repeat on our DVD player. I think I know all the scenes all the way through. Do you remember this scene? Uh, the two lions sit on the edge of this cliff and look over the vast expanse of Mufasa's kingdom. Now, to do this right, I really need to try to get a James Earl Jones voice. I'll do my best. Mufasa says to Simba this. <clears throat> One day, Simba, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new king. And of course, Simba looks out in, in wonder and says, and all this will be mine. Mufasa says, everything the light touches. Everything the light touches, Simba says. But then Simba looks out to the edges, the margins of the kingdom, and asks his dad, what about that shadowy place? And Mufasa's tone changes. Sternly, he says to Simba, that is beyond our borders, and you must never go there, Simba. Mufasa, the Lion King, in other words, just told Simba to stay away from the margins. You must not go there. Did you ever get a Mufasa-like warning growing up? Uh, were there places where your parents told you not to go? Staying safe was the priority, right? 
Uh, maybe it was a street or a neighborhood or a certain part of town. For me, it was uh, an abandoned day camp in a park across the street from where I lived. You see, we had the chance to do what my parents told us to do, which was to walk to school long distance. We were in a new neighborhood. School was pretty far away. We had to stay on the sidewalk, but it took a long time. Or we could take the dark and, for a young kid, fairly dangerous path through the park and the abandoned day camp. This was a margin, a place where I couldn't go. I was not allowed to go. It wasn't safe. It was different. We could run into wildlife or strange people. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. I suspect for you, maybe your margins were a poor place or a place where people were different. Instead of being told to go there and make a difference, we instead were guided to avoid these places. They were shadowy places. And margins are shadowy places. They're messy places. Margins to various degrees are places with difficult problems, desperate people, and dangerous environments. In the margins, we also find people, and often children, who are pushed to the edges, limited by geography, by circumstance, by culture. Marginalized people often lack choice. And today, that marginalization is made even worse by the pressures and the direct and indirect impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. At World Vision, we spend a lot of time in the world's margins. One place that is in the margins where World Vision has a presence is a country called the Central African Republic, or CAR. CAR today is one of the hardest places in the world to be a child. Bob Pierce, the man who started World Vision, wrote this statement in the flyleaf of his Bible. He said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Friends, car is one of those places that break God's heart. I visited there in 2018, and we put together a video that shows a glimpse of what the margins look like in that country. Take a look. Car, Central African Republic. This is a country that barely makes the news. A country many people don't even know exists. It's here that fighting between Christian and Muslim armed groups, the Selika and anti Balaka, plunged the country into chaos years ago. But things have gotten worse. In 2018, the Central African Republic was rated one of the saddest countries on earth. What's happening today isn't just because of Muslim and Christian tensions. These armed groups also clash over the control of resources like diamonds and gold. They take territory by violently attacking villages, killing hundreds of people, burning farms and recruiting children to join their forces. The crisis in car is overwhelming, but it's not like other emergencies. This is a long-standing, forgotten crisis. For any stability to occur, long-term programs tackling the root causes of conflict are required. World Vision has brought together Christian and Muslim faith leaders who are working to break down religious divisions created by armed groups. Even in the midst of chaos, there are pockets of change. In remote villages, child soldiers have been freed from armed groups. Through peace clubs, these youth learn how to promote peace in their communities. Together with World Vision, religious leaders are creating farming groups that work across the lines of faith to promote acceptance between Muslims and Christians. Peace is literally being grown from the ground up.
seeing those images from Carr, they break my heart. They bring back some challenging memories. And you know, I so regret that even recently, we've seen an uptick in violence in Carr, threatening vulnerable communities even more. And that's on top of the impact of the COVID pandemic. Let's be honest. It's hard to hear some of these stories, to look into the margins of our world. Whether they're near or far, whether they're in our lives, our communities, or around the world, margins are challenging. But let's talk about what I mean when I say that following Jesus means going to the margins, or at least caring for those in need in those shadowy places. Today, I'd like to look at a short text from the Gospel of John where Jesus ventured into the margins of his world. You're probably familiar with the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. I'd actually invite you to open your Bible with us. We're going to look at the words of a section of John 4 today that will help us understand what it means to follow Jesus here. John 4 is a wonderful story of hope and faith. And the whole chapter actually deserves full treatment. But I want to look at just the introduction. We'll see that in verses 4 to 9. And we can see how Jesus looks at people in the margins. So let's look at John chapter 4, starting at verse 4. It says, Now he, and that means Jesus, had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well around noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? What did you catch in the reading today? Did you get a sense that even in Jesus' world there were margins? The question for us today is to ask, what can we learn about Jesus interacting in the margins? And by extension, what can we learn about ourselves and as his followers? So the information in these verses is profound when we read the verse carefully against the first century Jewish backdrop. So a couple of things to remember. As we read this story, we've got to keep in mind that Jews and Samaritans uh, were not friends. In fact, they would have considered themselves enemies. It's interesting even today how religion has a way of driving conflict. You see, Jews and Samaritans, even though they were from the same background, similar culture, similar language, they had very different ideas about where to worship, what holy book to use, and so on. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that the text says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, think about this for a moment. Uh, let me highlight this in case you're not familiar with biblical geography. If we think about, uh, over here is the Mediterranean Sea and the, the countries that we're talking about all are around the edge. Down here we have in the south, Judea. Up in the north, Galilee, with Samaria in the middle. Now Jesus wanted to travel from Judea in the south up to Galilee in the north where he was kind of escaping the crowds. The acceptable route from Jude the Judea area was to cross over the Jordan River in its southern portion where people could skirt the Samaritan region and then cross back over the Jordan River in its northern portion to Galilee. This wasn't the direct route, but it was the way that Jews traveled so that they could avoid Samaria. If Jesus and his disciples were using a smartphone in AD 33, these are the settings they might use on Google Maps. Avoid tolls, avoid highways, avoid Samaria. So clearly he could get to where he needed to go, avoiding Samaria. So there had to be another reason. Now, one of the main handbooks for Bible translators says this, the language in this passage where it says that Jesus had to is the same verb where in John 3, just a chapter before, it talks about Jesus or the Son of Man had to be lifted up. So when we think about the way that these words are used, we should think of this as almost a divine necessity. It must have been God's will or God's divine purpose that Jesus should pass through Samaria. There were other ways to get to where he was going. 
Samaria was on the margin for the Jews, yet it was a divine necessity for Jesus to go through this marginal place. Well, in John's Gospel, we also see this interesting theology where Jesus is an imitator of the Father. Uh, in John 5, verse 17, uh, it says later on, Jesus is actually accused of working on the Sabbath. And you'll remember that he defends himself by saying, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Jesus is the obedient one. He imitates what his father does, what his father commands. In every way, Jesus is in step with God. So much so that Jesus says to his disciples that the one who sees him also sees his father. My pastor sometimes says that Jesus was God with skin on. And Jesus shared his father's heart. And God's heart beats for those in the margin. That's not really surprising. You know, if we go back in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, we read passages again and again, like this one in Deuteronomy, where it says that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the foreigners residing among you. Now, another interesting piece of information in these verses is the use of the word nearby. Did you catch how the deep history of God's story for the Jewish people is near or nearby this Samaritan village? In verse four, uh, we're told that the village of Sychar is nearby to the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well is there too. This sounds familiar. I mean, Jacob and Joseph are big names in the Old Testament storylines. And the gospel writer makes the point that all of this rich history, core to Jewish identity and culture and religion, is nearby. He specifically points out these key connections. Also, did you know that the word nearby is actually the same word that can be translated as neighbor? All you have to do is add an article like the to the Greek term, and it means literally the nearby ones, which is translated as neighbor. This is the same word that's used in the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it interesting how John uses this word to describe Samaria and Samaritans? to describe the margins. John is essentially trumpeting, hey Jews, you are connected to this story and the people here are your neighbors. Jesus sees our neighbors in the margins. The challenge for us is, do we see what Jesus sees? Well, Jesus now in the text goes even further into the margins. Not only has he entered a region that is off limits to most Jews, but he interacts with one who is in her own marginalized state in this context. First of all, women in this context, this place were second class. A Jewish man talking alone with a woman who is not his wife was unheard of. But we know that there's even more to her story. Margins beyond margins in a manner of speaking. The woman who came at the well herself had been ostracized. We know this because we see the way that Jesus is interacting with the woman at the well and when. First of all, there were no other women there. And second, she came at noontime to draw water in the heat of the day. You know, in my travels with World Vision around the world, uh, I have spent a lot of time with women and children talking and socializing and learning around wells. For many places, many villages, that's the social connection. Going to draw water is something that we do together, that women connect with, build friendships. And it's often done in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening. Here in this story, we get a sense that in this Samaritan community, they have put this woman out into her, or her own shadowy place a telltale sign of being in the margins. I'll pause there and just ask ourselves, are there other telltale signs in our own communities that we can look to see that people are outcasts today? Maybe in your, our homes, our families, our schools, our neighborhoods. Here we see this woman is a Samaritan. She's a woman and an ostracized woman. Each one of these factors marginalized her. And yet, as she stood at the well, Jesus, in a single sentence, indicates that he sees her as valuable and not rejected. 
please give me some water, he says. Now, some versions omit the word please. To us, that may actually sound a little rude, but he speaks to her and acknowledges her presence and her worth. I wonder if he hadn't been quite so forthright, uh, if she would have even have heard him. You know, are, are you talking to me, she might have asked. He even, he even indicated that he would be willing to drink from her ladle, which was so shocking even to her that she said to Jesus, how can you even ask me that? Well, that takes us to the end of the introduction. John 4 goes on to tell a remarkable story, including the moment when Jesus reveals himself to be the Messiah, the first time in his ministry, not to a king, not to a religious leader, not even to his own disciples, but to this woman. But I'm going to leave that story, the rest of the story, for your pastors for another time. Because we have so much to learn just from this profound introduction. We learn that God's heart is for those in the margins. That the Son of God, in perfect imitation of his Father, went to the margins. And that the people in the margins are our neighbors. This snapshot of Jesus going through nearby Samaria, reaching out to a Samaritan woman at the well, it's a picture of Christ and God's kingdom. We get a glimpse of what it means to live in God's reality. What do we see? God is the God of the margins. His love reaches out to the edges, to the fringes, to those shadowy places. So are you getting where we're going? where God wants to lead us. Following Jesus means having him lead us to the margins. If you and I want to follow Jesus, it is necessary to go to the margins. If we are to be Christ-like, Christ-minded, Christ-led, our new trajectory is to move out of the center to the margins. Do you know what Christian means? It actually means little Christs, little Jesuses. That's who we are. We should act like him and value the things and people that Jesus did. And this story we know actually includes people who did follow Jesus to the margins, his disciples. Now, in the introduction, we just see Jesus, the Samaritan woman, but we're ref we know that the disciples came with him and are off to get food. They were in this unexpected place and meeting marginalized, unexpected people because they were simply following Jesus. Later in the story, we see that they were astonished when they saw him talking to the woman at the well. It violated almost all of their understandings about the margins and their culture and their people because Jesus showed a different way. The disciples didn't understand everything. <laughs> Sometimes if you look at the text in the Bible, you kind of think that they didn't understand Jesus most of the time, but they followed him and it changed everything. So how do we follow Jesus to the margins? Well, there are lots of ways we need to pursue this. The question is, what will you do? What will I do? What will we do together to make our way there as we follow Jesus? This is huge. Remember when I said earlier that during Disney's Lion King, Mufasa's uh, utterance to Simba was, that is beyond our borders and you must never go there? Let me contrast what Mufasa said to Jesus, who is called also a lion, the lion of Judah. The lion of Judah roars in the Bible. He says, I will build my church to be the light of the world, to do the good works of mercy, justice, and love, and the gates of hell that have imprisoned the vulnerable and the weak, children, families, and communities will not prevail. Jesus is the king of a new kingdom. Just like we see that glimpse in Isaiah 65, never again will there be an infant who lives but for a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. A new kingdom and a new earth. I want to follow that king. And God is calling all of us to. Now, of course, we can find people, families, communities, all on the margins, even in our own community. Some of the margins God calls us to are right in our own backyard. It doesn't take long to think of marginalized people or groups. Because when we see how Jesus sees, we notice. 
But at World Vision, we have a particular calling to follow Jesus to the margins in some of the world's toughest places, usually outside of our borders. To us, these places, however remote, however difficult, however dangerous or shadowy, are nearby. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew 25, um, Jesus talks about the people that he calls the least of these. Who are the least of these in the world today? Many of them are girls and boys in places, fragile places, like Central African Republic or other challenging parts of, parts of the world, like Afghanistan, where I visited before the pandemic. I went to Afghanistan to see our work in this fragile context. And I realized that, you know, when we, we don't talk about marginalized people as, a, a, as just a group, these are individual girls and boys, mothers and fathers, families and community members who have names and stories, just like the story of Banesh. I met Banesh in a mobile health clinic in Afghanistan. I was there seeing some of World Vision's work and meeting with families who were, had been affected by drought. They had been displaced from their homes because of a lack of food and clean water and shelter. And Banesh was in one of our mobile health clinics getting medical care. Banesh was 14 years old. And when I sat down to talk to her, I quickly realized though that she was not just there to get care as a child, she was there because she was nine months pregnant with her second child. Banesh was getting maternal care in anticipation of trying to have a healthy child. Instead of playing, instead of uh, enjoying childhood, she had been sold essentially into marriage, forced marriage at the age of 11 to a man much older than her as part of their cultural practices, as what was seen as economic desperation in that context. We had a chance to talk with Banesh, who said that she hoped for her children not to have the same experience. She hoped that her daughters would grow up with the opportunity to live up to their full potential, to get the education that she's never had. I'm glad that World Vision was able to help Banesh and her family to get that kind of care that was needed for her children to grow up healthy. But there was not much we could do to change the story that Banesh was living. And frankly, we hear stories like that and it's hard not to feel overwhelmed. Some of you may even be panicking right now, thinking that I'm gonna tell you that to follow Jesus means hopping on a plane and going to Afghanistan. That's not true. You may be called exactly to where you are right now. In fact, right now, I'd invite you to stay away from Afghanistan. But it doesn't mean that you can't go and reach out and support activities reaching children like Banesh in the margins. Well, let's go back to the snapshot of, of this, this story once more in John 4. You see that the disciples weren't immediately with Jesus because they had gone to the market to buy food. Have you ever wondered where the disciples got the money that they were going to spend to buy the food? Well, we know. We know from Luke's gospel, chapter 8, we learn that there were faithful women who followed Jesus as well. We learn the names of some of them, like Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, as well as many others who were left unnamed. Now, they weren't front and center. They weren't actually able, for their own cultural reasons, to be with Jesus in Samaria but they are critical to this story. All of them were told, provided for the 12 disciples and Jesus out of their resources. Luke's after, actual words were that they served them out of their resources. They served Jesus and became partners in his mission by providing for him and the 12 disciples. The entire Samaritan mission that started in John chapter four right here with Jesus' two-day visit in that territory, was facilitated by people who themselves were not even able to be there. But their partnership with Jesus became a catalyst for an entire people beginning their journey toward Jesus. I want to leave you with a final story, once again from the Central African Republic. You know, we're in the season of Lent right now, moving towards Easter. That was when I visited Central African Republic as well. In fact, it was right near the beginning of Holy Week and I was in one of the worst affected areas, most conflict and affected and violent areas of Central African Republic on Palm Sunday. 
Now, for a time, I went to an Anglican church, and I remember on Palm Sunday, we would all be passed out with a little palm frond, and we would go on a little march around our courtyard saying Hosanna. Well, when I was in Central African Republic, that was not enough. We were given whole palm branches, joined more than 500 members of that church and the whole community, and walked not just not around the courtyard, not around the church, but around the entire community. About a five kilometer procession as we circled that community that had been affected so badly by violence and pain and sin and difficulty. And we proclaimed that Jesus was coming. Hosanna. We were welcoming the light arriving in the darkness, recognizing that God, Jesus, was already at work in that community. As I joined that procession, as we walked around that community, I realized you know, that, that sense that, that I was part of something bigger, that we were responding to Jesus' call was profound. And it's something that God offers all of us to, to be part of, to join the work that he is already doing in bringing light into even the most shadowy of places. Let's reach the margins together. Let's continue to answer God's call. Let's follow Jesus' lead and reach out even to those tough places, to the world's most vulnerable girls and boys. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today. God bless you. Well, welcome back to our point after, and we're again so glad that we can have uh, Michael Messenger, president of World Vision Canada, with us. And Michael, um, today we thought in our point after we could just do a little bit more deeper dive on some questions about what World Vision's doing in the midst of the pandemic. Um, let's begin, though. I want to make it a bit personal with you. Um, you know, you preached on following Jesus to the margins today. And I know you personally that you've been to a lot of difficult, dangerous, hard, heartbreaking places. How do you stay positive? Um, how do you stay faithful and, uh, and hopeful in the midst of this? Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, and thank you to, to you uh, as well, Brent. Uh, it's really great to be with you both. Um, you know, part of it comes from my sense of calling. I mean, I've been called to this role. I really feel like God has brought me to this place where uh, part of my role and part of the privilege that I have is to actually go and gather stories of vulnerable girls and boys who are showing such incredible resilience and courage in tough places. But you're right, I see lots of hard things. Um, I'm, I cry like anybody, I, I, you know, I feel challenged by that. Uh, but for me, I think I, I'm, I'm able to really hold on to just the, the, the values of, of God's kingdom where he promises that this is not the way it's going to be all the time. You know, as Christians, we kind of live in this, this now, knowing the kingdom of God is here, but also not yet. My favorite verse is actually in Isaiah 65. Uh, halfway through the verse, he talks about God creating a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and where, and he describes what the, what the prophet describes what that looks like, where children, you know, don't die. People have a chance for a meaningful life. There are right relationships with God, mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with creation, with each other. True reconciliation takes place. And I kind of hold on to that, knowing that this is just a temporary time. So what can we do now to live out those values of that future kingdom? And that's certainly what drives me. But it is, it's a challenging place to be sometimes. Mm, for sure. Thank you for that. You know, as we're listening to your message, you draw out this idea of being warned from going to dangerous places. And, uh, you know, we all, every city has these places where we've been warned not to go. And what happens, I think, is often we grow fearful of these places and we then maybe just to cope, we t that turns into indifference. What advice could you give us to sort of challenge that indifference and fear and, uh, well, whatever that is? You know, Brent, I think that the most important thing is to try to make points of connection with people that we might otherwise think of as, uh, you know, them compared to us. I think sometimes that fear of the margins is because people are different from us, as I explored in the message. Uh, they, you know, they might think differently. They may be in a different environment. But actually, when we focus on the things that uh, hold us together that are similar, it helps break down some of those, those barriers. So, for example, I always find that if I can say, as a parent, the way that I care for my two kids here in Canada 
the love I have for, for them, the hope I have for them, uh, their potential. It's not any different from somebody in, you know, a mother or a father in South Sudan who cares for her or his children. Mm -hmm. And try to make those points of connection where we can bring their stories and our stories together. It, 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 it brings that difference between who's the other, who's the us and who's the them. It's mm -hmm. just us. And I think that's really a key thing. Uh, one other really practical way is, as well is to look for people who have helped amplify those stories and maybe help understand them. So sometimes it's also, we can be fearful of what we don't know or understand. And so sometimes if you go to an organization, it's an advocacy organization or one like World Vision, where we tell stories and help explain, uh, look for groups that are kind of mediators or bridge builders who can help, you know, that, that, that connecting point between what's happening, quote, over there and what's happening in our lives. So the more, mm -hmm. again, coming back to that point of, of making those common commonalities clear, those points of connection clear, whether as parents or as just understanding uh, what's going on in different places that, that you know, humans find themselves in this world. Mm, thank you. So Michael, of course, um, the global pandemic has been a challenge across the board for every organization, for every agency, for, for I know for us as local churches, and I know as well uh, for World Vision Canada. But in the midst of all the stress and uncertainty, I'm wondering what are some of the creative responses World Vision has come up with during this time? And what are some of the sort of the big learns or maybe new ideas that you're going to take with you in the post-pandemic uh, time with World Vision? Yeah, you know, this has been the largest humanitarian response in World Vision's history. And that's in, World Vision was founded 70 years ago. And trying to, to figure out how we can be absolutely focused on our mission has been really key. Um, 0% business as usual, 100% mission as usual. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the, the approach that we have been taking. Mm -hmm. And really, that, that is one creative way to anchor any decisions that we make, whether it's at the local church or the family level, schools, whatever. What are we all about? That's, that has really driven us and helped us realize every decision that we make in response, whether in Canada or around the world, how is this helping improve the lives of vulnerable girls and boys, even in challenging places? So that's so being really mission anchored is a really critical element for us. I think another part for us here and around the world as well is that we recognize that, that the pandemic has, bring, has brought some immediate changes to the way that we do our work. And so we had to really respond very quickly, respond at speed, making decisions very fast to kind of address the, what's right in front of us. But if we just responded and without thinking about what the next situation or what the future might look like, then we might actually find ourselves not investing in the right kinds of things, adapting, transforming to what we, we don't really know what the next, the new normal is going to be, but we might know what the next normal is. So we all, we've responded, but also wanting to make sure that we adapt the work that we do. And I think that's a really good thing to always have that mindset of what's happening now, as well as what's the future mm. holding and making decisions in light of your mission and both of those. Mm. And maybe the final thing I'd say, Dave, is, and I had this conversation with our staff, you know, especially after a year or more, where it is just, you know, you feel weighed down. Everyone was a little almost excited at the beginning, kind of like, you know, it's like going on a camping trip, <laughs> um, you know, out of, boy, it's going to be a chance to kind of have this adventure. Well, that's fun for a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months. You can kind of keep at it. And then it just becomes a bit of a drag. And then you get a second lockdown or a second wave. And it just becomes really heavy. I think at those moments, it's that's that our tendency is to really look inward and focus on, on um, you know, the challenges that we're facing, you know, even the fear. I had a chance to share with the World Vision staff a while ago was we really just wanted to make sure that we get our heads up and look around. And how do we move from fear to a posture of faith? Hmm. You know, if, if, if God can create streams in the, in the desert, you know, he can break through here. So how do we, how do we hold on to that, that faith? It doesn't mean that we can't be fearful, but our posture should be, you know, moving toward faith. How do we move to a posture of courage rather than feeling captive? Hmm. I'm mindful of Paul writing in the Roman jail where, He's, you know, he's, he's writing there. He's probably close to, you know, being executed, but yet he's writing and talking about, I'm going to continue to, to, to run the race that God has put in front of us. That's, that's encouraging. And then finally, I said, now's the time for us to stop asking why now and be open to the question, what's next? Hmm. So just changing that perspective, trying to see what is God teaching us even during this time of, of challenge? 
it's hard to do, but I think just that, that kind of shift of looking down and looking out is one way that we can adapt. And that's certainly what we're trying to do at World Vision here and around the world. Wow, that was great. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. wonderful. Um, you know, in your message, you mentioned this, uh, this the Jews and Samaritans were enemies, and uh, we know that was mutual. They had a similar feelings for each other. Uh, I'm sure World Vision has to go into situations all over the place where you're meeting that same kind of resistance from suspicion and whatnot. What are some uh, practical or just any advice that World Vision could give us to overcome these, these um, antagonisms that we see in our world today and perhaps even in our own relationships? That, that's a great question, Brent. And you know what? It's actually something that we in, in the humanitarian sector has, ha, have learned as a root cause of so many of the other things that we try to adjust, uh, address, whether it's poverty, injustice, you know, the way those come out, like hunger, nutrition, child protection issues, a lot of it has to do it at its root with conflict mm. and the lack of reconciliation. In fact, I mean, this is a bit of jargon, but in, in organizations like ours, we used to talk about emergency relief and long-term development and advocacy as kind of the, the pillars of our work. We realized that peace building, reconciliation actually has to anchor all of those things. If we don't talk about the root causes, then we're going to miss that that chance. Mm. So how do we do that? You know, we talk about Jews and Samaritans. I was in the Central African Republic not long ago and pre-pandemic, of course. And one of the critical works that we were doing there was, yes, we were addressing the immediate needs like clean water, shelter, child protection, uh, dealing with people in displaced people's camps. But we were also developing a set of peace clubs where we were working with children from different groups there is kind of a religious conflict, tribal conflict. It's a, it's a, it's a mixed uh, situation. But we were finding that by bringing people together, focusing on reconciliation, telling people's stories, helping them understand what other people were experiencing, was actually going to be a really key intervention. And it's actually something that World Vision has been able to do as a faith-based organization as well, where we can, we can convene faith leaders, in that case from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, local Muslim clerics, because we came from this perspective that, that faith is, and, and reconciliation and peace are really critical to, to the response. We could bring people together to have those conversations. Huh. But I think it's, it's the same whether it's, we're talking in somewhere like Central African Republic or in our own context where we may have, we may have uh, difficulty or conflict and that is, the, the, I think the first step is to hear people's stories, see what we can do to help walk in somebody else's shoes. Uh, I mentioned earlier about, you know, what does it mean for to be a parent here compared to a parent somewhere else in the, in the world? Find those points of connection, mm. uh, I think, is a really starting point. And that, that's what is our peace clubs and places like Central African Republic are built on. I think it's the same kind of principle that we have to, to put in place so we can understand what others are going through is the starting point for us to, to get beyond those differences and focus on what holds us together, not what takes us apart. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Michael, we got to wrap up. I got one final question. Um, so I know that World Vision Canada has a heart to create um, vital uh, engaging partnerships with local churches all across Canada. And, uh, and yet I think that we know that most of our churches really are small, you know, in, in the sense of 50 to maybe 150 in the congregation. And a lot of those churches, when they look at these big global issues, they go, what can we do? So what can uh, uh, you know, most of the, our churches do in partnership with World Vision Canada uh, to help the most vulnerable children of the world? Yeah, you're right, Dave. I mean, World Vision, we have a heart for the local church. It's, it's a key partner. It's named in our mission statement is that's how we want to accomplish, uh, you know, bring, bring the, the, proclaim the, the good news of the kingdom of God. Uh, in the world is, is in partnership with the church. But, so we can speak about the church more broadly, where we think about what does it mean when we talk about the good news of the gospel? If we miss out on talking about the need for us to not only meet needs here, as well as spiritual needs, uh, to ensure that we're talking about injustice and social issues and how we can work together and, and be bringers of light and darkness in our communities, uh, that's, that's one element. So 
One is to let, let's talk about these things in our church. Just the fact that we're having this conversation and I've had a chance to share with you about World Vision's work and about the margins is, is exactly what we are looking for. Let's, let's talk and recognize how God can be part of that and how we can respond to Jesus' call. But then as the church is also a collection of Christians who want to follow Jesus faithfully. And, you know, at World Vision, we believe that each one of us has the opportunity and the obligation even to, to say, how can we respond to the grace that God's given us in reaching out to others and demonstrate God's love? We can do that as a church gathering together. We can raise funds. We can raise awareness. We can respond. Uh, but even as individual Christians, there's lots of ways that we can connect in to local organizations or organizations like World Vision that acts as a bridge to some of these margin, marginal places in the world. Uh, one way to, for example, sponsoring a child to, to World Vision through World Vision, uh, where you can have a build that connection, really help walk in their shoes understand together what it means to, to, to fight poverty and injustice mm -hmm. in places that may feel pretty marginalized to us compared to, you know, the situation in Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, what does it mean for us to, to, to make that connection across the world? So, you know, speaking and preaching and making space for conversations like this one, responding together, you know, donating or supporting World Vision or other organizations that are doing good work. And of course, praying, praying for uh, those members of, of uh, our family that are on the other side of the world, but, you know, bear God's image mm. and have every bit of potential as, you know, as, as, as our kids do here. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, well, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this point after. Um, and again, uh, Michael, we just want to, again, thank you for joining us in this uh, digital space. And yeah. uh, I think it was a great opportunity. So thanks again. Yes, thank you. Thanks for this chance to, to have a homecoming to my home, hometown of Moncton. This is uh, fantastic to be, be with you. What a privilege it's been to have Michael Messenger here with us today from World Vision Canada to share with us a bit of his heart. Uh, I hope that you saw in both the message and in our follow-up conversation a bit of the heart of Michael about the world's poor. And uh, of course, the church has always been connected to uh, the poor right back into the book of Acts when Paul was saved by God's grace and uh, wanted to bring the gospel to the non-Jewish people. The, the church in Jerusalem said, sure, but just don't forget about the poor. And Paul said, that's exactly the thing I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, we need to have that same heart in us as well. Perhaps we can't go to the margins literally. Perhaps we have to be like that group of women in the Gospel of Luke who supported Jesus' ministry financially and in other ways, um, even though they were maybe shut out uh, culturally at that time. You know, it's important for us uh, to understand that God opens doors for us to help and to do ministry in the world, even if we can't be there ourselves. And World Vision is one example of that, MCC being another. Uh, these are not competing organizations. I hope you caught that from Michael's conversation after, in the point after. Um, you know, he, he would love to have support to World Vision, but he just simply wants to energize the church to help the world's poor. And we want to join in that, in that same heart as we look for what we can do in our city, uh, in our country, and in our world. Well, anyway, uh, I want to give thanks to God for Michael Messenger and for what he's doing with World Vision Canada. And I want to thank you for joining us here today. It's my prayer that God would be with you as you go into this week and that he would inspire you and comfort you and be your shepherd as we looked at earlier on in our time together. But as we go, let me pray for you today. God, we thank you for Michael, and we thank you for the message that he brought to us. We pray your blessing on World Vision Canada, and uh, we pray your blessing on MCC. We pray your blessing on MDS, on all these people who give of their time and energy and skills to um, meet people in distress and uh, meet people at the worst of times. And uh, God, we pray that you would help us as a congregation and as individuals to do what we can to join you in the margins, in the ways that you provide for us. And so, God, we ask that you would help us to do this, and we just pray that you would bless us as we go into this world and as we are these healing agents of your grace. Help us, Lord, to be that um, as we go into this world this week, 
be with our families and our friends and our, our connections, be with our province as we uh, move forward in this um, uh, health crisis that we are in. And we pray, God, that you would bring an end to it very soon. For we pray all of this in the name of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, thank you for joining us here at River of Life today, and I will see you again in seven days. Relevant, practical, authentic, River of Life.